Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Dinosaur Facts. This episode will be the beginning of a series where I explain Earth's time periods in depth, starting with the Mesozoic Era, the coolest one, and its first period, the Triassic. An age of, huh, let's try this shit out, and the first baby steps towards dinosaur dominion over this world. Before we dive in, remember to like and subscribe, or you'll get torn limb from limb by a post -asucus. The Triassic period first began 252 million years ago. This was immediately after the Earth had been completely and utterly shit-stomped by the Permian Extinction, or the Great Dying, as it's known on the streets. This was the closest we ever came to the complete sterilization of life on Earth. But that's a discussion for the Permian video if that freaky ass period gets one, so for now, all you need to know, this was a critical point in the biological history of our planet, where the hierarchy of species and biodiversity got majorly shaken up. So if you see some weird shit in this video and think to yourself, Ew, why would he do that? Just remember, Earth was kinda having a midlife crisis. At the beginning of the Triassic period, all of Earth's land was fused into one large supercontinent, Pangaea, who you may have heard of. With a single giant land mass, logic would follow that there was also a single giant water mass, Panthalassa, or the All Sea, which is a tough fucking name. But besides the cool names, life in the early Triassic was the fucking pits. The early Triassic was a hot, arid wasteland with some temperate regions, mainly near the coasts, mostly due to the fact that the Earth had just been effectively deep fried. But also, since all of Earth's land was in one big glob, rainwater had a tricky time finding its way to the center, making for the biggest and hottest desert this little dust ball has ever bore witness to, maintaining a cool 120 to 140 degree Fahrenheit. The environment was very unstable, going through many smaller extinction events in the years following. At the very start of the Triassic, basically all the trees were gone, once again a result of the entire planet being burnt to a crisp. But now, cycads, ferns, and conifers would start to regrow, but mainly around the coasts, where there's, uh, water. On this just barely recognizable ball of sand, small, early relatives of mammals called cynodonts were widespread. Still technically a reptile, but you can see the family resemblance. These little fellas would burrow into the ground and make dens where they would raise their young. A smart evolutionary strategy, but unfortunately one that will get stuck in for quite some time. Another mammal-like reptile, Lystrosaurus, lived all across Pangaea. It was a pioneer species, a survivor of the Great Dying, and one that capitalized quickly on the clusterfuck that was the early Triassic, by breeding like rabbits until they covered the globe. And I don't mean covered hyperbolically. These little dickheads were at one point 75% of all vertebrate life on land. Imagine going outside and three quarters of all animals are these pudgy little bastards. Some other familiar faces begin to evolve around this time. Triadobatrachus, the first frogs, filled the early Triassic swamps and waterways. Alongside the Mastodonsaurus, a gargantuan amphibian who was doing the whole crocodile shit before it was cool. Another interesting creature popped onto the scene, Erythrosuchus, the largest predator at the time, measuring in at 16 feet long, 1 to 2 tons, and sporting a head that would give Stewie Griffin the sweats. While not particularly interesting in and of itself, this guy is the start of a legacy that will span the Mesozoic era and beyond. One of the first archosauriforms, the group that would flourish in these coming millions of years and spawn not only the dinosaurs, but also the pterosaurs, crocodilomorphs, and eventually, the pigeon that won't stop fucking cooing outside my window. Other archosauriforms started to appear during this time, like the Pseudosuchians, a group of crocodile-like predators, Pseudosuchia. They'll be important later, as well as a funny little lizard dude named Euparcaria, and a Silisaurus, a Silisaurus, which was a Silisaurid, which is silly. In the oceans, things weren't quite as shitty. Sharks and most types of fish survived the Permian extinction, as well as ammonites, which were like if squids used cool shells to cover up their disgusting bodies, as they should. If none of that aquatic life sounded appetizing to you, then that's okay, because the world's first oysters appeared in the ocean in the early Triassic as well. Neopterygii, by far the biggest fishy family today, grew in numbers during the Triassic. And when I say biggest, I mean it. Name a fish. Go on. I mean it. Go to the comments and name one fish. I guarantee you it's one of these fuckers. Lots of reptiles said fuck this noise and returned to the ocean around this time and turned gross. 
Some stayed near to the shore and fished from there or the shallower waters, Tanistrophius, Atopodentatus, and Placotus being some particularly strange examples. And some explored the ocean ocean, like Nothosaurus and its relatives, darting through schools of fish to catch its prey. These animals were actually the first to evolve the ability to give birth to live young, which reduced their dependency on land. And then the ichthyosaurs, a small and speedy group of marine reptiles, copied the shit out of their homework and completely put them out of business in the following years. Many of these early ichthyosaurs were small, like Grippia and Utatsusaurus, but they won't stay that way for long. And so, life kinda chilled out for a little while. The early Triassic turned into the Middle Triassic, which, if I'm being honest, is a total filler episode. The Ichthyosaurs and Archosaurs continue to do well. Pseudosuchians, who I mentioned earlier, grow into apex predators like the Rauasuchians and start culling the Lystrosaurus population. Relatives of Lystrosaurus started to grow a bit bigger to account for this, like Diademodon and Rabidosaurus and other archosaurs evolved shit like this to defend themselves. Cycads and trees spread across the world a little more, but with no rain whatsoever, the middle portions of Pangaea were still pretty depressing. The only really interesting part of the Middle Triassic is that we might have gotten our first dinosaur, maybe? Nyasasaurus is a potential species of dinosaur based on a capital P partial skeleton with a slightly uncertain age. Some people say it's a dinosaur, some say it's almost a dinosaur, but not quite. Either way, noteworthy. And then it was the late Triassic. 237 million years ago, the year of our lord, this is when things get interesting. And this new age, one that would set the tone of life on this planet for the preceding 170 million years, began with a raindrop and then several quadrillion more. After the world had finally adjusted to living in effectively an easy-bake oven for the past 25 million years, rain began to fall further inland than the world had seen in a while. This was called the Carnian Pluvial Episode, where rain fell nearly constantly for 2 million years. Some say it was caused by volcanic eruptions dumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Some say it was an ancient civilization who industrialized too fast. I guess we'll never know which one. Either way, once again, this shook up an already damaged global environment, as animals that had spent millions of years evolving to arid, dry, and blistering conditions got torrentially pissed on for two million years straight. As you'd expect, this made the world much less dry, and added a bit of greenery to the scenery, like rainforests and swamps, where there used to be sand and sand. The world would slowly swing back towards dry and arid, but many species adapted to these new environments. Lystrosaurus had fallen out of style, replaced by rhynchosaurids like Hyperodabodon. These beaver-toothed fucks used said beaver teeth to shear through the tough vegetation of the late Triassic landscape. Bigger relatives of Lystrosaurus, like Placerius and Lizowichia, gathered in large herds. Phytosaurs appeared, a group of reptiles that look a whole lot like crocodiles but are actually not. I checked, I swear. These reptiles and giant amphibians like Metoposaurus patrolled the waterways, as well as Van Clevia, the closest thing to a cartoonish sea monster. I think I've ever seen. The first turtles showed up around this time too. Meet Adontocellis. Donatello's great-great-great-great-grandpa, by the way, so show some respect. But one group did particularly well for themselves in the late Triassic, none other than the Archosaurs. They were better adapted to Earth's new climate than the synapsids like Lystrosaurus and spread out across Pangaea. Adasaurs evolved, some of the largest and most well-defended herbivores of the time. They look pretty metal, but this entire family will be extinct in like 30 million years, so I wouldn't worry about them too much. Smaller Archosaurs like the Japanosaurs took over the trees. They they kind of just looked like lizards, but they did weird shit like this. Poposaurs, things that really, really wanted to be dinosaurs but didn't try hard enough, also evolved during this time. Don't worry, we're getting there. Crocodilomorphs appeared for the first time, simultaneously one of the greatest and most overpowered lineages to ever grace the Earth's servers. Although they didn't really look like crocodiles yet, since the phytosaurs were still copying their homework. Well, technically, I guess the crocodiles copied their homework, but you know, tomato, tomato. Pterosaurs also appeared in the late Triassic, with animals like Patinosaurus and Eudimorphus 
it on. The first to ever develop powered flight, except for bugs, but as a matter of personal principle, I choose not to recognize bullshit in my science, and those are some fucking cheaters if I've ever seen one. Anyway, if you feel like the pterosaurs kind of just popped out of nowhere, then you're in the same boat as the scientists. They're definitely archosaurs, but beyond that, science is a little stumped. Some think they came from small, lizard-like archosaurs like Euparcaria or Scleromoclus. Some say the family are derived from smaller gliding reptiles like Cherovipteryx, and some think Tanistrophius, I guess. Certain pseudosuchians like Rauisuchus, Postosuchus, and Fasolasuchus were the apex predators of their time. Some grew to be as big as the large theropods to come, and hunted the mammal-like reptiles of the day like Placerius. Now that you've got me talking about them, a slight detour from the archosaurs. The mammal-like reptiles were definitely present in the late Triassic, mostly though just to be fodder-ass prey animals for the larger predators. These Rauisuchians were so efficient at killing and maiming that they actually effectively wiped out all mammal-like reptiles by the end of the Triassic. And with virtually no mammal-like reptiles remaining, what was left to do but become mammals? The first of this new furry lineage, what would soon become chimpanzees, quokkas, and your cousin Stevie, was Brasilodon. The first mammal evolved from synapsid reptiles. Brasilodon was a small shrew-like animal with a revolutionary new ability to shoot nutrient-rich nectar out of its nips. You may be a touch desensitized being a mammal yourself, but in case you've never stopped to consider it, that is a wild adaptation. Recently, this dog came into my place of work. It had eight saggy titties that were practically scraping the floor as it meandered its way around. It was scaring away customers and making this <laughs> noise as it clung to the little bit of life that its greedy little puppies had left inside its nipples. And I just remember thinking, good God, what great sin had we wrought as mammals to deserve such a punishment? And that's all I have to say about that. In the oceans, things stayed relatively the same throughout the Triassic period. Hinotis showed up, who looks an awful lot like a turtle, but he tells me he's not. The first plesiosaurs likely evolved, but we're not positive. Conodonts existed, and uh, gross. And oh fuck, the ichthyosaurs got big. But of course, there was one more group of archosaurs that I failed to mention that experienced massive success in the late Triassic. Remind me again, what's the name of this channel? Mr. That's right, bitch, it's the motherfucking dinosaurs. Like I said earlier, they might have shown up for the first time in the middle Triassic, but these bastards were definitely here by the late Triassic. The birthplace of Dinosauria, what should be a goddamn holy site, is a quaint little fossil bed in northern Argentina. Eoraptor, the first 100% scientifically proven for sure dinosaur, was a 4 foot long 20 pound little ankle biter. What is he specifically? No one knows. Sauropodomorph, likely. Theropod, I could see the resemblance. Ornithopod, now nah, you're losing me. Pererosaurus, a larger early theropod, was likely only outcompeted by Saurosuchus in its environment. A, you guessed it, Rauisuchian. But have your time in the sun, Croc, the dinosaurs are coming. As the late Triassic turned into the later Triassic, prosauropods appeared, a short-lived but crucial step towards the big-ass dinosaurs later down the line. Plateosaurus, Riohasaurus, and Thecodontosaurus were some of the earliest relatives of the most massive animals that would ever set foot on this rock, and they dominated the late Triassic, pushing out the larger synapsids as the presiding herbivores, eventually getting pretty massive, up to 40 feet in the case of Lysemsaurus. Smaller and more delicate early theropods like Coelophysis and Lilian Sternus populated the world, acting as the world's coyotes, while animals like Postosuchus were like the grizzly bears. Well, coyotes that devour each other's children, anyway. Dinosaurs pretty quickly became widely successful across the world. And, spoiler alert, but this is just the beginning. Yet, after 50 million years of throwing shit at the wall to see what's stuck by pure evolutionary chance, nature got bored of this shit too, and decided to nuke it. And by nuke it, I mean pull itself apart at the seams. Around 200 million years ago, Pangaea got a divorce and started splitting right down the Europe and North America. You would think they would send a memo to the world's volcanoes, but apparently not, so they started crashing out hard. This would end up being one of, if not the largest volcanic event this planet has ever seen. An area of about 4 million square miles, about 1 and a 20th United States, just starts gushing lava. Um, it's actually called magma. <laughs>
This threw Mother Nature for a loop, bouncing between global warming, global cooling, wildfires, ocean acidification, acid rain, mercury rain, we'll put it this way, you'd be getting the day off school. By the end of this shitstorm, 75% of all species on Earth were no longer with us. Oceans took a major hit, losing 96% of coral species, which seemed to take a heavy hit when massive extinction events occur. Hmm, that's interesting. Ammonites had a rough time too, being reduced to a small handful of genera. Fish weren't hit too bad, except for more ancestral groups like the conodonts, thank Christ, and marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs survived. Except for the big ones, they did not do so well. On land, things were a tad grim. Archosauria took some major hits. The Aetosaurs, Drapanosaurs, Rawasukians, Poposaurs, Phytosaurs, Rhynchosaurs, even the silly sores, all gone, reduced to bone and rock. Some new Triassic inventions persisted, like turtles, frogs, and pterosaurs. Crocodilomorphs like Hesperosuchus took over the gap left open by the phytosaurs, and mammal-like reptiles were all but extinct, only survived by those little mouse fucks that found refuge in the trees and burrows. Well, I hope you little turds like it down there, because that's where you're gonna be mostly stuck for the preceding 135 million years. Why, you may ask? Because the dinosaurs a pretty unassuming little group in the Triassic, would rise to the occasion and fill just about every ecological niche left open by the end Triassic extinction. And so it was fate that on the dawn of the first day of the Jurassic period, the world knew whose bitch it was. And that brings us to the end of the Triassic period. I hope you guys enjoyed, and even if you didn't, at least you know all there is to know about one of Earth's periods. Let me know what I missed, as I'm sure there's lots in 50 million years of biological history. While you're down there typing me beautiful, beautiful, beautiful comments, a like and smashing of the subscribe button would be greatly appreciated. That's all I got today, boys. Bye. <laughs>